like everybody, everybody, man, I got a smooth dude on the channel today. Ooh, he got the hat, he got the backdrop, he got the glasses, he got one of them real leather jackets. I'm talking about that butter soft leather. He killing them. Man, let me tell you something. I believe he probably, and, and still is, one of them GQ type guys who is conscious, along with sharp dressing, uh, conscious on black history. He dedicating his days and times to help others understand black history in his town. And you know what? The people there like him for doing this. He's on to something big, and I'm super excited that he has come on Strong Inspirations. Let me tell you something, my friends. I've been asking this guy to come on because I hear nothing but good things about him and what he's doing that I could not sleep last night waiting for this moment. And when I clicked on, he was already here. He was ready in position to go. I, I, I said all that to say this. My name is Anthony Broughton. <laughs> and you with strong inspirations. Well, you know what we do. We give it to you straight, no chaser. I let these people, I find them somehow, intoxicate your mind with Black history. Now, some of it is a little devastating. And I say a little because I ain't going to say the majority of it even though we know the scenario. But we all have come out of this maybe a little bit better. Some people have even lost their lives for the fight of others. Um, did you watch the video of the guy who talks about what happened, the real backstory to the, uh, the Selma to Montgomery March? Because when they uh, finally knew they being the racist, that we were on the side of right, they helped protect them marchers. You got to watch that video. When did you watch the video of the lady who talks about the uh, the day that that white guy sold two hundred and fifty slaves in one day? They call it weeping times. Can you imagine why they call it that? Because what was going on was so devastating that it rained for the days of the of the auction. If you're going to do this, you're going to have to do it in the rain. Watch that video. Did you watch the one? And I'm, I'm, I'm a man. I know he got to go. I got, but I got to tell you these things. Did you watch the one where the lady says that her father, her grandfather, rather, was was a college educated man, couldn't get a job, opened up a fruit stand. This is probably about the 40s and 50s in one of them southern towns. And was doing so well that the white guy said, man, I can't let you outdo me. He goes over to the guy. He slaps him, right? The guy slaps him back. He says, oh, shucks. I know this ain't going to be good. He goes home and get his family. And he leaves that night. Just pack up what we got. We got to get out of here. Goes on, makes a nice little living for himself. Everything is well. Come to find out as things go. His father has died and he wants to go back home to the funeral. He goes back home to the funeral and you know, they never saw him again. You can assume what you want, but they never saw him. And he was a happy guy. He was loving his family. It wasn't like he, if you want to say he may have left, no, that ain't the scenario. Never saw him again and had two small kids. Left a wife devastated. Watch that video. And I got one more. Did you see the video I got? A lot of people don't know who's the first black in the NBA. It's a guy named Earl Lloyd. It was three guys that was drafted that same year. Earl Lloyd was the first to hit the floor. Coming out of one of them HBCUs. Was a bad dude, though. Six, eight, power, power forward type guy. I interviewed his son. Is on the channel. Couple more things, I'm gonna go fast. Come to my festival in Kansas City, Kansas. And I consider America's largest underground railroad site in a town or a neighborhood called Quindaro. We're gonna walk where the slaves walk. We're gonna hear the voices. And I have put together a good program. Come and meet me there Memorial Day weekend. 
I, I, I'm remiss. I don't have a copy of my DVD of a movie I did standing here in front of me. Uh, my man made me nervous, and I, I don't know what I did. I just left it somewhere, but I got them. I don't even sell a DVD no more. I just it's streaming on Amazon. It's called Business in the Black, The Rise of Black Business in America. Watch that. 75 minutes long. It starts and ends with a guy who was 101 years old at the time. I got a book out. See, I'm serious on this Black history thing. My book is called Black Business Book. It's got over 200 facts. And I just ordered another supply of them. You ordered, you, you, you ordered I send it out the same day, and I autographed it. Uh, do that. Uh, you can learn all about that and my festival and the other things that I do on my website, businessintheblack.net. Now, you hear me use this term strong a lot. It's the name of the channel, Strong Inspirations. It's everything I do is the word strong. I like strong. And strong stands for strength, tenacity, resilience, and a sense of oneness, nobility, and grace. And that is my introduction to my super sharp, strong soul brother, number one. Uh, sir, introduce yourself. Thank you for coming on here. I I'm super excited, man. You, you got to tell that. <laughs> Come on, introduce yourself. Thank you. Hello, my name is Ralph Hunter. I am from the African American Heritage Museum of Southern New Jersey, located in Atlantic City, New Jersey, and Newtonville, New Jersey, where we have two museums. I'm coming to you today from Atlantic City. Uh, I'm sitting in front of a painting that was recently uh, acquired by the museum. Uh, a lady snuck into our museum one day. She was incognito. We didn't know who she was. It turned out that she was Whoopi Goldberg. And when Whoopi Goldberg came into the museum, she was really fascinated. And the next day we were on The View. She talks in terms about, you don't have to travel to Washington DC to see a great museum. When you come to Atlantic City, it's closer come to the Atlantic City African American Museum. I love That's it. That's you. Yeah. So a week's time, uh, we heard from Whoopi Goldberg again, and she wanted to make a donation to the museum. So there was a painting scheduled to go to the Smithsonian in Washington, DC, the piece you see behind me. It's called Photorealism. It's done with a number two brush, looks like a photograph, but it's a painting done by an artist by the name of Ogal Oziri. He's from Israel. And he did this piece of Whoopi Goldberg. And Whoopi Goldberg had this piece not go to Washington, but come to Atlantic City to our museum. Love it. I got to stop you there. I got, I got to stop you there only in this regard. Yeah, okay. what, well, I, got, I got to ask a couple of questions on you. Uh, where, where, where are you from? I'm from Philadelphia, born and raised. Uh, be, being in Philadelphia, what, what, where did, uh, let me ask you this then before that. Do you know where the, uh, the slave, uh, the slavery is in your family? What, you know, do you go do back? Any? Oh yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. We've done our, all of our genealogy and we go all the way back to a town down in Yazoo City, Mississippi is where my family came from. Do you uh, we know, were... uh, are there any stories in there that like did something happen? Uh, how they got to Philadelphia? Oh, well, my dad got to Philadelphia because his father was a, a preacher. We're part of the Church of God in Christ. Oh, and really? He, um, my grandparents were the founding members of the Church of God in Christ. And my grandfather started a storefront church on Beale Street in Memphis, Tennessee. And when he started the church, he was able to get the heathens coming in and out of the tap rooms and the bars and come into the storefront church. And my father used to play the trumpet in front of the church on top of a, a crate. And he was such a great trumpeteer, he was uh, sought after and brought to Philadelphia by Bishop O.T. Jones of the Church of God in Christ in Philadelphia. And that's how the family got from uh, Mississippi to Philadelphia. Of course, I was born later on in Philadelphia. Yeah. I wasn't born. 1938. So that's how our family got to Philadelphia. And my father's trumpet that he blew in front of the church on Beale Street is now in the Smithsonian Museum, the African American Museum. Of that right? It's next to a couple of other great trumpeteers. Um, that right? A guy by the name of Louis Armstrong. <laughs> yeah. It's here next to the um, 
some of the great church leaders that uh, got involved in the church are early on. Uh, let, let, let me ask you this then. Now, I, I got a guy on the channel, and he's out of, uh, out of, out of uh, either Birmingham. When, them pre when, the, when the preachers did the good things that they did, there would be people, in particular the racists, because sometimes the preachers would say, we got to stand up for rights and stuff like that, that they themselves had, they faced some, uh, some, 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 some stuff. That never happened to your father, anything that you know of where the racists said, we, we, had, we tired of you helping people. No, the, well, that didn't happen because they were back in them on an old plantation in Yazoo City, and um, the families grew up from there, and they eventually all left uh, Mississippi and came north. Some went to Chicago, Philadelphia, New York, and the family scattered pretty much around the country because that was part of the of the great um, the industrial revolution in this country. Yeah. And people came north. They came out of the cotton fields and tobacco fields to get a job working for Ford Motor Company yeah. or for Pullman Porter or yeah. building or ships during the war. Yeah. Um, you know, they worked in a lot of the shipyards. I know yeah. my dad worked in a shipyard in Philadelphia. Oh, really? Yeah. Did, 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 uh, have you been to the plantation or have you been to that town? Oh, yeah, we go there every two years. Absolutely. And the land is now owned by our family. Um, oh, really? They do there now. The family um, has been there um, back to the 1700s. That's when they were slaves back there. So it was really amazing. And uh, from our family, um, the gentleman, one of my cousins, went on to become the Secretary of Agriculture of the United States of America. Um, really? Came off out of that farm and out of that farm. It's called the Lewis family, yes. Well, I, I lost you there for a minute. Would you like to meet the enslavers of your of your uh, ancestor? Yeah, in answer to your question, yeah. That would be a wonderful conversation to have, talking about what happened in slavery and who um, were the keepers of the plantation. How did you get to like Black history? How did I get to like Black history? And, and dedicate always, your life like you have. I was always... Um, uh, a believer and finding out where I came from to know where I was going. So history was my, um, my thing that I was really excited about. In particular, uh, American history. Now, African-American history is American history. Yeah, that's right. And I knew that from a young age. And I was never deterred from understanding uh, true history about all peoples in the world. But and more importantly, I was excited about African-American history to be able to follow the, the footsteps of my ancestors and to be able to tell the story about Atlantic City, New Jersey, which was an area that uh, was in, uh, inhabited by a bunch of black Republicans who arrived in town back uh, 152 years ago. Really? To boardwalk, to build the, the beach, the railroad, to build the hotels are all built by people who look like me and it was yeah. really amazing. So some 30,000 people came to Atlantic City to work in the, that industry, the hospitality industry, uh, back in the late 1800s. And so when they arrived, they were forced to live in a certain neighborhood. Yeah. That was called the north side of Atlantic City. And some 30,000 people inhabited that area, but they lived there year round. What happened to most of the visitors who would come to Atlantic City, they would come and spend the summers, but at the end of the summer, they would go home. And so the black folks were able to stay here. So there was a gentleman by the name of Nucky Johnson, who okay. was a politician, who was able to stay in office for some 34 years. And he knew the importance of having that vote in November from the African-American community. So he really was very, very kind to them. And he elected the, hired the very first female police officer in the United States of America in 1927. Her name is Maggie Cresswell. Uh, she was hired because in that section where the African-Americans lived, it was a large voting block for the politicians. And it went on to be a movie and an HBO series. It's called Boardwalk Empire. I don't know if anyone has ever saw that. We got 19 Emmy Awards. I was a consultant for that film. Oh. But coming back to Atlantic City and the importance of the Blacks coming north during the Great Migration and prior to that, it was so important that they lived and they voted and they were all very well rewarded for their deeds here in Atlantic City. 
So what happened, those neighborhoods stayed the same until um, the Civil Rights Act in 1965. And a little started to change back in Brown versus Boer in 19, uh, um, when uh, Ruby Bridges was able to cross the color barrier with, um, of course, um, uh, the Brown versus Board of Education with Thurgood Marshall. And that changed a lot uh, about what happened in Atlantic City. Now, we used to be able to come to Atlantic City in the summertime and visit, and we'd be able to go to any beach we wanted to. Uh, the beaches were not segregated in Atlantic City. What happened was that the hotel owners got complaints from their guests in Atlantic City Boardwalk, and they said, we have a problem. There are Black people in our water and on our sand, and we're not going to come back to Atlantic City unless you get rid of these Black people on the beach. So they passed a law in 1927, and that law went on to tell the story that uh, African Americans are no longer allowed to go to only one beach <coughs> in Atlantic City, and that was called Missouri Avenue Beach. And the reason they chose that particular beach was that the Boardwalk Convention Hall was in that particular bar, and that was owned by the city of Atlantic City. So the hotel owners couldn't complain about that. So that's where the beach was established. It was established in 1927. Let me ask you, and was there something wrong with that beach? Oh, no, it was a perfect beach. Yeah, perfect it wasn't like beach. it had more rocks on it and nothing no, like no, that. No, 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 perfect beach. And we had entertainers from around the world who would come to that beach because we had a large entertainment area in Atlantic City. It was called Kentucky Avenue. And we had a very beautiful nightclub there. There were some 37 liquor licenses in Atlantic City owned and operated by people who look like me. And tens of thousands of people would come each and every day throughout the summer to come to visit the entertainment center. We had such people here as Billy Holiday, uh, Wild Bill Davis, um, uh, Sammy Davis, you name it. Every major entertainer in the country came to Atlantic City because it was part of the chilling circuit. And the reason I say chilling circuit is the entertainers who came here would come in the summertime for some 14 weeks, which was the summer season. And they would all come and have one night at this wonderful club. And it's really, really amazing. The nightclub held 3,000 people. And they had a show there. It was called a breakfast show. It was a very, very important show. It was at 6 o'clock in the morning. And people would go to the beach and hang out all day long. And eventually, they'd end up at the Club Harlem for the breakfast show. And the beautiful part about the Club Harlem, there was a gentleman who came here from Philadelphia. His name was Pop Williams. He had gone to the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, and he was a doctor. And when he arrived into Atlantic City to become a, a physician and practice his field, uh, he found out that there were 13 African-American doctors here serving some 30,000 people. So he decided to go into the gin mill business. And that's when he bought the old Fitzgerald's nightclub and turned it into Club Harlem. And that was just the entertainment hub of the East Coast. It was larger than Harlem, New York. It was larger than the South Side of Chicago because it had the influx of people who would come here every week throughout the course of the summer, by the tens of thousands. They drove their beautiful limousines, dressed in their beautiful outfits. It was really, really a great thing to see in Atlantic City that happening. And coming out of the church as I did, when I first arrived in Atlantic City to visit a friend of mine one Memorial Day weekend, I got off the bus and saw, you know, 15, 20,000 people who looked like me, who owned their own hotels, they owned their own restaurants, they owned the all of the businesses, their cab companies, the jitney companies, they owned and operated everything on the north side. It was truly, truly amazing. And coming out of a racist town like Philadelphia, I had never had the opportunity to see that. So I fell in love with the town, and I've been here ever since 1954. I love so it's it. Quite good for me and yeah. good for the history of Atlantic City. Um, we recently had um, a wonderful show at the Hard Rock Casino for Black History Month. And we brought in Kurt Franklin, and it was really an amazing show. And we partnered with Hard Rock in that particular venue. And it was really a great financial reward for the museum. But how the whole thing got started, if I could just change the- Yeah, the yeah, go ahead, yeah, yeah. The museum got started because I grew up in Philadelphia. Uh, my parents had moved to a neighborhood. Oh, hold on, let me stop you there. Let me stop you there, because yeah. we're going to get to that. Philadelphia, that was where a lot of Black people fled to during slavery. So Philadelphia had a big black community. 
Well, yeah, uh, South Philadelphia was a mega hub for African Americans. You know, um, you got to remember a lady like Marion Anderson, uh, Paul Robeson, all came out of Philadelphia. And it was just an amazing uh, educated town. Um, uh, schools were not segregated, just neighborhoods were segregated. Okay. So you lived in a neighborhood that was redlined, which mean you went to a school that was in your neighborhood. You couldn't go to the school in the white neighborhood. You had to go to school where you went yeah. to. Yeah. And of course, um, we all grew up in, in great high schools and the Philadelphia school system was absolutely outstanding. So then that led into you uh, loving uh, Atlantic City like you did and then developing this museum as you just were about to allude to. Yeah, you know, the museum development came a lot later. Um, I was in business for many, many years. I was in retail. I was in the export import business for about 40 years before I even um, started to uh, display things in, in, the, in, in the museum or anything of that nature. So um, I've always collected African-American uh, memorabilia. The very are, first are you the time, founder of the museum? I beg your pardon? Are you the founder of the museum? Founder, yeah. President and founder of the museum, yes. Oh, my God. Uh, and this is how it got started. Yeah. Um, growing up in Philly, coming back to that stir, yes. we had moved into this neighborhood that was um, that was all white. We were like four black families in the neighborhood. So when I went to kindergarten, um, the teacher used to read a story to us all the time. And she the name of the story was called Little Black Sambo. So when she <laughs> I remember as a little child putting my hands in my ears and never listening to any of the words. And the reason for that was at Graham Crockett time, who was I? I was Little Black Sambo. So I was very much offended by, by the book, the name, the title, the whole thing. So one day I had- Hold on, let me stop you there. Let me stop. You, you were offended because you're dark and complected. No, I was offended because I was black, one of the four black kids. Oh, in the school, when the school had white kids. Oh, yeah, I got it. Whole school was whole school was was white. Um, only four black kids in my kindergarten. I got so, you. So she was reading that, it to, to 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 be disparaging. Yeah, she was reading it to her white students, and I so got that you. they would look at me as I was a little black Samba. I got you. So you got it. So, um, I remembered that all my life, and so. Uh, then I, um, about 45 years ago, I said, I'm going to start collecting African-American memorabilia. So I took a five-year sabbatical. I just sold my company and I headed down south and I went to North Carolina. So when I got to North Carolina, I went into an antique store and I asked the clerk there, did she have anything that was black or African-American? She said she had one thing, but her boss didn't want her to put it out. They didn't want to offend any customers. It was in the back room. If I was really interested in purchasing it, she would go back in the back room and get it. So she goes back in the back room and she comes out with what? The book, Little Black Sambo. Oh! <laughs> now I'm regressing again and saying to myself, why did I tell this lady that I'd buy anything she had? So um, I bought the book. So um, on the way out of the antique store, I said, I'm going to buy every Little Black Sambo book for the next five years and have a big bond fire and burn them all the hell up. That was my thought. But I took the book out to the car and I opened it up and I started reading. Do you know the story of Little Black Sambo? Yeah, I was going to ask you, what is the story? Yeah, yeah. It was about this little black boy. His mother makes him a new jacket, new pair of pants, a new pair of slippers, and he has his father's umbrella. And he asked his mother, could he go out into the jungle, keyword jungle, to play? She says, yes, don't go far because it's dangerous out there. So as soon as he gets out into the jungle, a tiger comes up to him and roars and said, if you don't give me that beautiful jacket, I'm going to eat you up. Little Black Sambo said, what are you going to do with the jacket? He said, I'm going to put on my hind legs. When I walk through the jungle, I'll be the most handsome tiger in the jungle. Along comes another tiger and roars at him once again. said, if you don't give me those beautiful trousers, what are you going to do with the trousers? Put on my front two legs. When I walk through the jungle, I too be the most handsome tiger. Along comes a third tiger and roars at him once again. And said, if you don't give me those beautiful slippers, what are you going to do with the slippers? Put them on my ears. So when I walk through the jungle, I too be the most handsome tiger in the jungle. Along comes a fourth tiger. Little Black Sambo, the only thing he has is his undergarments on, hiding behind a tree. And he sees he has his umbrella on his hand. He says, if you don't give me the umbrella, I'm going to eat you up. So what are you going to do with the umbrella? I'm going to put on my tail. So when I walk through the jungle, I too be the most handsome tiger in the jungle. Now the tigers have his jacket, back legs, 
slacks, front leg, <laughs> on his ears, yeah. and I'm brought with him. So now that um, the tigers are prancing around the jungle, and they're going faster in and out of the trees and everything, then they decided to take off all the black sambo's clothes and put it alongside of the tree. Then they start chasing each other around one tree in particular very, very fast. And they went around the tree so fast, they melted and they turned into a mound of something you put on your pancakes. And what is that? Syrup. No, the other yellow. Tigers are yellow. Uh, butter. Butter. The okay. So now little black Sambo sees that the tigers have melted and turned into the mound of butter. He gathers his clothing and runs back home, tells his mother about what happened to him. And he was really, really upset. Along through the jungle comes his father. His father has this urn on his head. And he sees this big mound of butter. And so he gathers the butter, butter and brings it home. And he asks the little black Sambo, what was his day like? And he told him what a terrible time he had. He said, well, how many pancakes uh, would you like to eat? He said, I could eat 100 pancakes. Father eats like 83 and mother eats like 31. But see, the moral of that whole thing is yeah. it started over a book written by a lady by the name of Helen Bannerman. She wrote this story while traveling on a train through India for her two girls. It then was told to be about a little black boy when my teacher read it about little black Sambo. But it really, we have no tigers here in America. Yeah. So it wasn't about us here. It was about something that was occurring in India. So you take that that negative, turn it into a positive, yes. and you ask yourself a question. And the question I have for you and your listening audience is, um, when they were growing up on Saturdays or Sundays, uh, sometimes your parents made you pancakes, waffles, or French toast. Then I asked a question, what kind of syrup do you put on your pancakes? And what do you say? Ain't your mama. And then I say, I ain't your mama, your mama's at home. So I get it? <laughs> <laughs> I got you. All the way around there, yes. you, get that, you get that laughter from yes. you. And, on, and, and that's how the museum actually gets started. So now we have at the museum more than 13,000 artifacts. Our warehouses are three times the size of our museums because our collections are so humongous. Um, we have- uh, well, Let me stop you right there. Let me stop you right there. You started out what though? And what kind of building in your first days? Well, I, st I first started off by going to schools. I started showing um, little exhibits at schools in Black History Month. And then we were at a location in Pleasantville, New Jersey, and a newspaper reporter came in and he said, this is a fantastic idea. You ought to have a traveling museum. So it went in the newspaper the next day, which was uh, on a Monday, and a gentleman from a town called <clears throat> a Buda Vincent Township in, in Newtonville, New Jersey, He's the mayor of the town. He reads the article about this African-American traveling museum. And he says, I have a location for you in Newtonville, New Jersey. So I went there, some of the board members, we looked around, it was 6,000 square foot building. This That's was a town that was inhabited by African-Americans, which was founded by William Still, who was uh, one of the plant doctors yeah. and one of the first people to start the charcoal fields there. And um, so we went there, the town was a black town and had a one room school for African-Americans. And that's where we located the first museum. And then we, um, eight years ago, nine years ago, um, we partnered with a university here in New Jersey called Stockton University. And they got a lease on a building that's 15,000 square feet. Yeah, to Atlantic City. So now we have two locations. Then we have a museum that travels. I go to about a hundred universities and schools in four states with our traveling museum. We take over the gymnasium in a school or a college and we bring in one of our exhibits. One of our exhibits that we travel with, it's called Stealing Home. Stealing Home is the exhibit about Jackie Robinson's $3 million exhibit. And the exhibit tells a story about Rachel, of course, his wife and how he got started in the Negro League. That exhibit has his cleats, his bat, his balls, his uniforms that he wore back when he was in the Negro League as well as the Brooklyn Dodgers. And we have five other exhibits. We just created a new exhibit. It's called um, This Little Light of Mine. And it's the history of the black church in Philadelphia and New Jersey. Uh, Mother Bethel was the first AME church in Philadelphia. Bishop Richard Allen started that congregation uh, many, many years ago. 
and we tell the history of how churches got started. They really got started with my, my grandfather and them. They were on the plantations. They had church in the cotton field. They had church in the tobacco field. They had their congregations meet there. When Mr. Charlie wasn't watching, they were praying to get right. out of slavery. They were right. praying to have a better life for their children and their grandchildren and their great-grandchildren. So that went on to start the black church. And when Bishop Allen was removed from the white part of the AME church, he started the AME Mother Bethel Church in Florida. So that's and another right. exhibit we got. So what happens when we have our exhibits, we take uh, 17 students from a school We'll set up the gymnasium and these kids become the presenters they're called docents a docent's a person who presents at a museum right. so that for that particular day they get the information like three or four weeks before we get there what exhibits coming they have a lead teacher who works with them they explain all the information each one of the students then assigned to a certain panel or a certain table and they do that all day long so we can handle up to 900 students in one day so we go from school to university to university. Months of January, February, and March are very, very busy. Yeah, course. sure. Very so busy. now, hold on. Oh, did you know this was going to happen to you? No, 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 no. All I had was a desire to tell the story. I didn't know who wanted to listen. I knew I wasn't paying good attention to what I was saying. And I knew I had the foundation to uh, be in business. I knew I had the foundation to tell a story. Um, coming from a, uh, the, my dad out of the pulpit and my grandfather out of the cotton field, I always um, thought that one day that I might be a, a clergy, but I found my missionary, my mission, of course, in history. And yeah. um, it's like me preaching here, like, like um, one of the big um, preachers around the country, telling a story about religion. I can tell that same story about American history that's African-American history. And it doesn't matter what uh, school or university I'm lecturing at, yeah, I can tell that story because I think the black story has to be told by someone who looks like who. Yep, looks like I got who. you. Let me ask you this. When, in your early days, and, and we, we almost could come to a close, so to speak. In your, what was the early stories that you told? I know um, you might have talked about that book, but there was there another go-to story that you like, I know I got them when I tell them this one. Yeah, I, I know I know I have them when I tell them a story about a family called the Pettijohn family. They arrived in Atlantic City in the late 1800s. They were from Delaware. And when they arrived in Atlantic City, Mr. Jeremiah Pettijohn got a job working at one of the hotels. And he was the bellman at the hotel. And he had a staff of 40 people who worked for him. And the reason he got such a large staff because the visitors who came here would be 300,000 people would come here on a weekend. And he worked at one of the hotels on the boardwalk. So he said to his workers, if you want to be a chambermaid, don't, you're, that's no good. But if you want to be a bellman to get tips and make extra money to feed your family and send your kids off to school, I want you to work for me, but I want 10% of each one of the tips that you get. So he uh, went he, he's a black guy, white guy? Black guy. Black, black guy. Black okay. Guy. Petty John. Petty. Yeah. And he um, went on to buy a house in Atlantic City, and he paid uh, $8,000 for his house in 1910. Um, so he was a collector of fine art and the family's been living there for four generations. So the family was dying off and it was like the fourth generation and they were selling out everything at their house. So I went to the house to see what they had that was museum quality. So when I arrived at the house, they had nothing but junk in there. Nothing that was museum quality. So I asked the guy to I go out to the shed kitchen, which is the room beyond the, the kitchen to look around out there. And then the house was in disrepair ceiling was falling through. It was just a terrible place to go. As soon as I got out in the shed kitchen, I took my flashlight and I put it up in the corner and I saw a table at the end of the, of the, of the shed kitchen. And I took my pocket knife out of my pocket and I scraped the table five times. And I put a little saliva on my finger and I put it on underneath the five layers of paint and the table turned red in color. Uh, so I knew the wood would be an oak wood or some kind of a fruit wood. So I said to the guy, I'd like to buy this table. So when I tried to take all the junk off the table. There was a painting underneath the table. And it was a painting of a gentleman by the name of Jeremiah Pettijohn, um, who the guy was who yeah. actually worked at the hotel. So I said, I'll, I'll buy it and I'll buy the table. My best story and I'm sticking to it and I'm loving history. 
And if anyone ever has the opportunity to come to Atlantic City, New Jersey, we welcome you to visit um, one of our museums. They're open to the public. Our hours are from Wednesday through Sunday from 11 till 5. We're closed on Mondays and Tuesday. What's your and website? A website is A-A-H-M-S-N-J. That's the acronym for African American Heritage Museum Southern New Jersey dot O-R-G. I got, I got one more comment and I'm gonna, I'm, I'm gonna let you go in this regard. Are, are you proud of yourself? I'm, I'm happy to have a reasonably good health. I'm happy to be able to have a, a museum where we have um, never had to meet a payroll. Uh, uh, I think my parents um, uh, did a good job with all of um, their children. Some yeah. went to become ministers and things of that nature. Yeah. Um, I'm, I think that they look down on me and say, um, uh, thank God almighty that um, that boy is doing God's work but a totally different way. Yes, I love it. I, I thank you so very much for uh, taking time out because you know, let me tell you something, you an icon and it, you can't convince me otherwise. Mm -hmm. And, 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 and I, I can feel it through the, 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 the camera, through the pauses and everything that you an icon. Because uh, you spent you spend your time volunteering to help others. Absolutely. Well, uh, that that's the mission. Uh, that's the mission. You have your mission. I have my mission. Your mission. You're able to reach out to the American and be able to tell a story and bring people onto your program that yes. has something to uh, tell the full story. Everyone yes. has a different part of the story. No yes. one can tell the whole story. I think I got a piece, you got a piece. Yes. Joe Jones down the street has a piece. Right. Larry Lou has a piece. Everybody has a story. Everybody's got a story. Um, I remember uh, going into a restroom in one of the casinos and I used to all go and wash my hands and after whatever. And the guy would say, what's your story? He says, everybody's got a story, Mr. Hunter. What's your story? And we all have a story. And the story just must be told. Yeah, and yours is on display. Story. Someone who has the network and the listening audience that you do so we can share the story. Yeah, the yours is on display. You an icon. I, I say this with all sincerity, my brother. I want you to stay strong, stay I safe, I stay promise. on your grind. I love what you're doing. You, 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 thank you for coming on the channel. I'm coming to meet you. Okay. Uh, I just said... I, I hope and pray you at least get two views of this. Yeah, you, we 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 oh, we get more than that. How about this? Do you have an event like a big fundraiser or something like that? Did everybody or y'all do Juneteenth and that kind of thing? Yeah, well, we, we don't do the the Juneteenth. We're doing it in one of our museums in Newtonville. We're doing Juneteenth on the nineteenth of June in our yeah. museum in Newtonville. But um, uh, I'm still on the road traveling to universities uh, as we speak. I'll be at a college uh, tomorrow with an exhibit called um, This Little Light of Mine. Um, we'll be there for, I think, for two weeks at that college. And we'll go there, we'll lecture. So I'm on the road, and that's how we are able to keep our museum open because of our traveling museum. I love it. Um, we don't take grants. We don't do any of those kind of things. Every dollar that we raise, we raise it within, from within the house. So, um, that's how we're able to. You know, but 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 you wouldn't mind some of the viewers doing some donations. They can do that right through the website. Oh yeah, they definitely can do that. We have, okay. They can, okay. They can just go to our web page we talked about, and they can yeah. make a donation on our web page as okay. well as you. Okay, no question. Okay. Uh, thank you for coming on the channel. I appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule. Uh, let me tell you something. You were well well worth the wait. I'm a better person today. I'm knowing that there's somebody I'm like you. I'm humbled for being invited. Thank you, Reverend Sir. Everybody, Mr. we out strong inspirations. Thank you, Brother Hunter. Thank you. May the good Lord continue to bless you and your family. Yes.